Borlaug, Associate Director for External Relations at the Norman E. Borlaug Institute for International Agriculture. My gosh. <laughs> at Texas A&M, so we have to make oh, it as long as possible. Yes, yes. Exactly. We just call it the Borlaug Institute. So. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to start off. You mentioned that your grandfather, Norman Borlaug, mm -hmm. was not a very good communicator, though he was a great scientist. What right. makes you say that? Well, I, I would say to the general public, he wasn't a good communicator because he always kept it at a level that that was on a scientific level, that, that was language that scientists would understand and, and people who understood agriculture. He wasn't ever to truly convey, in, in response to biotechnology and things like that, he wasn't able to convey that in a way that the general public would understand. So when I talk about him not being a great communicator, I'm talking about to the general public in a way that you could persuade them or get them to understand the importance of agriculture and the role of innovation and, and biotechnology. And that's something that we can learn from today? Yes, I think we do. I think I, you know, someone brought it up today. I think we need training for our scientists to understand how they can make their message more acceptable and understandable to the general public. Um, the role of so social media is so big, and we need our scientists engaged in that. And I always um, tell people if you can't talk about your research and the benefit of it in 90 seconds so that someone can become engaged and, and ask questions then you've got a, communi a communication problem. So I think that's something we really need to work on. And, and we all in the ag sector need to change our message and make it a little more personal so people understand, and a little more emotional, so people understand why our work is so important. Not everybody enjoys communicating messages right. like that. But do you think it's still, they've still I, I, I think it is. And if they don't enjoy it, they need to appoint someone who knows about their research and their work to do that for them. And, and, and you know, where I work at Texas A&M, we have some scientists who are older and said, I'm never going to get on social media. I'm never going to do a platform like that. I'm not going to do Twitter. So it's really our communications team or some of the younger scientists who are training out of, under them to really accept that role and, and move it forward. Now you had used a lot of um, strong language I guess <laughs> regarding the differences in production practices. Mm -hmm. Would you ever say that you're anti-organic? No, I'm not anti-organic. I know I, I need to, when I talk I need to change that a little. My problem is organics are not going to feed 9 million people by 2050. It is not going to happen and we, and we have the research to do that. We are going to have to have integrated approaches and that involves biotechnology. Of course organic can be one of the approaches but it can't be the only single and it seems like a lot of the voice in organic or, or some of the loudest, not the majority but some of the loudest who get the bigger platforms are trying to take out the biotechnology and some of the um, newer innovation that's going on in agriculture and it's all about choice so I probably do come across as a little against organic it's not that I am but as we have to accept how they use farming practices they have to accept our practices and not take choice away from those who truly need it and I think that's where we are right now we have a um, very big group who seem to be removing choice from farmers, especially in developing countries who vitally need this technology to feed their people. Do you ever see organic ad adopting GM and being okay with biotechnology? There's a great book out, and I, I think it's um, uh, Our Table, and it's, about, it's by two UC Davis professors, one who works in organic and one who works in biotechnology, and how the two can merge. Because essentially, if we have um, wheat or, or rice and other stuff that doesn't need any inputs, but it's done through genetic modification. Isn't that truly organic? So I think, you know, 10 years down the line, when we finally have acceptance, I think we're going to get there and realize that through technology, we can lessen all the inputs and therefore it's truly organic. Are we talking enough about um, distribution in food security. We're always fighting organic versus inorganic. And, and, and really, yeah, and it's really a ridiculous um, argument to have because we're not um, really working on the main problem. And when you talk about distribution, there are things we can change right now, especially in developing countries, and I'm just going to say Sub-Saharan Africa on irrigation and roads. If we had the infrastructure, simple infrastructure, and we were able to provide them post-harvest storage. We could change a lot of the food waste that's going on. So those are things we really should concentrate on. We can do that right now. But we seem to be locked in this battle between the two, and there shouldn't be a battle. We, we have the ability to move forward. We have technologies that can change the situation. 
but we need to really address some of the infrastructure issues that are um, causing a lot of the issues for the farmers. So we're not talking about No, no. Well, we do. We do. We talk to ourselves about it, and that's one thing we do. We talk a lot within ourselves. But it, it, it's a complicated issue to get governments, especially in areas where they don't have the money to invest in infrastructure. And you do have a lot of um, other countries who are coming in, China for one, in a lot of areas in Africa and building roads and, and helping with the infrastructure. But a lot needs to be done in order to really move from an agrarian um, economy beyond an agrarian system that's up and functioning in a productive way because we shouldn't ever use the word subsistence farmer together. Okay. Um, so closer to home, dealing with food security, a lot of people are going urban agriculture. Right. What do you think about this movement? Is it bringing okay. people closer to agriculture? Well, I think it's great. I think it's exciting. It gets them to understand agriculture. Um, I think the Netherlands is, and their vertical gardening is, is light years ahead and an exciting area to go see. Um, is it going to be the answer? No. Can it be helpful? Definitely. I think in areas, um, I talk about in areas in New York and Chicago that have no, um, they call them food deserts, where you can't get um, any um, fruits and vegetables, and, and that population, nice right, really needs that. So potentially vertical gardening or ur urban gardening can help answer that. Uh, I guess, where do you see agriculture in the next 50 years? There's a great book I just read called The Agriculture Manifesto, written by a Canadian. Rob Yes, and it's a phenomenal book, and I think the 10 things he highlights is where we're going to see agriculture, and biotechnology is one, but he talks about robotics and informatics and all of the things that technology is going to help us and how we address agriculture. So I think that's really where I see agriculture going. I think it's an exciting place. I think it'll help. Technology always helps bring youth into agriculture, and I think um, we'll create a more sustainable form of agriculture, which we truly need. So that's where I see. So read the Ag Manifesto, and that'll help you see where we'll be in 10 years. And what are your next steps? My next steps. World food prize are <laughs> my next steps. Um, I just want to be an advocate for my grandfather's legacy and those who are continuing it. And, and I can be a vocal spokesperson on the need for biotechnology and, and GMOs and all innovation because I don't represent a private sector. I, don't, I, I do represent my university, but more so I represent the Borlaug legacy and how, it, and how those things help change um, what was happening in Pakistan and India. So that's where I want to see my role. And, and also I love helping in any way possible anyone who's doing something for the next generation, who's helping them engage in finding solutions to feed 9 billion people, who's helping giving them a platform, a voice, and mentoring them. And one of the exciting programs I'm involved in is Thought for Food, the Thought for Food Challenge. Look it up. We want everyone to participate. But those are the things that I'm really passionate about right now. Julie Borlaug, thank you so much. Well, thank you.